No. Uh, <laughs> it's our turn to heckle him. Uh, here he is, Moshe Zadka, to talk about immutable data structures. Give him a round of applause. Hey, uh, hi everybody. Yeah, um, feel free to heckle me. I, I, I think I deserve it, so it's okay. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to talk to you about immutable data structure, something I feel very strongly about. And I hope by the end of the talk you'll feel as strongly as I do. Um, so we'll start with a simple question, which is our stress rectangles. And like, what does this have to do with anything ever? Um, so our squares rectangles. Who here thinks squares are rectangles? Who here thinks squares are not rectangles? Um, who here doesn't have an opinion? <laughs> Too many people don't have an opinion. Um, okay, so what's a rectangle? Well, so like you know, like if you want to like you know put a rectangle in like a Python interface, that's how you put it. You can get the length, you can get the width, and you can set the dimensions. But wait, you can't set different dimensions on a square, right? Because like then it won't be a square anymore if you know length is not different than width. So that's not an interface a square can satisfy. That's it. Now squares can be rectangles, and I'm pretty sure when I learned math, when I was like, you know, yay tall, I'm still not very tall. Um, they taught me that I squares are rectangles. So that's weird, right? Um, however, if we change the interface a little bit, right? Instead of like saying set dimensions, we're like, okay, well, you can't change the dimensions of a shape. It's already on paper, drawn with a pen. You can't erase that, but you can get a new shape with different dimensions. That's fine. Squares can return new rectangles. They didn't promise they'll return the same type, right? Like the interface is like that returns a new triangle with you know different dimensions. So that's fine. So we notice something interesting, right? We notice that as soon as you don't try to change the thing, we can keep the square a rectangle, which is good because like you know math. Um, what's an array? An array is even more weird, right? So you know in Python we have like lists, and lists are like you know. Can have different types of them. You can have like ints and strings, and like you know, like have like a whole cacophony of things. But you probably don't want that, right? So if you want to actually interface up your array, you want to say, you know, okay, this is an array of things, right? So like you know, let's have an abstract interface for an array, right? You can get a thing, and you can put in a thing. That's great, right? And you can put in any thing that complies with the interface of a thing, right? Which you know usually will be like you know like a number or whatever, right? So it's really an array of numbers. So what if you have an array of super thing, right? Something that has like, you know, more things, right? So, you know, that's fine. Like, you know, same thing. It has a super thing. Um, it can put in a super thing. Now, can you satisfy both at once? They look very closely related. Is one a super interface of the other? Turns out no, and it's really like pretty bad. You cannot actually implement both interfaces at once. Why is that? Well, so um, array of thing says you can give me anything, right? So if I can only give you a super thing, I cannot give you any thing, right? If I can give you uh, only floats, then I can give you integers, right? So that means you cannot have a set element. On the other hand, um, array of super string promises you the sorry, array of thing says like, you know like. I can return anything, right? So you cannot promise that you'll also only return super thing, right? So you cannot satisfy both of these uh, interfaces at once. That kind of sucks, right? Like if you actually look into like you know things like C++, that's actually how templates work, right? You cannot have an array of like something in a superclass because of these problems, even if it's pointers to. So it's not like size problems. It's just not compatible interfaces. It's not very sad. Now, the other thing that is like very sad is global mutable state. It's pretty bad, right? Because you change something over here, it breaks something over here. This and this are probably like modules really far apart. And it's more likely than you think because a lot of things are like hidden globals, right? Like, you know, class attributes are really global and classes are kind of global and like everything like has tendrils into everything else and you can kind of reach through like, you know, five layers of abstraction go whoop. <laughs> and that's it, you broke this thing over there and that's sad, right? And like, then you have a bug, right? In production, something crashes over and over and nobody has any idea why. And you know, like you have to debug it and stay until 3 a.m. and like, that's not fun, right? So it's pretty bad. So immutability really helps with that, right? Like, so first, you know, how do I fix rectangles? Well, you know, like I said, like, you know, that's 
a nice interface, right? That's an interface, right? Like, so I implemented rectangle. It supports the uh, abstract interface of immutable rectangles. And I can implement a square, right? It still has, you know, well, I, I didn't, you know, uh, I can, you know, still have like properties, lengths and widths. And it still has width dimensions and it returns a rectangle. All right, so that's fine. Now, now squares are rectangles. Right, that's great. So you can actually implement both square and a rectangle. Um, and you can still, you know, um, so you can still change it, but you cannot change it in place. You have to return a new object, right? If you use Utter, then the Utter Evolve, which is built in. This is why Utter is such a good library and you should use it. And especially you should do this with frozen equal to because then you have immutability and you can have your rectangles be squares. Yeah, squares be rectangles. Um, now what if you have a lot of things, right? You're like, well, you know, yes, but my list is like, you know, one million elements long. Are you actually telling me to copy my one million elements when I want to change one thing? Sure, I can implement something that's going to be an area of thing and an area of super thing, but I'm going to be using up double the memory and really, really slow. The solution is persistent. Persistence is a really nice library, and this creates a vector of integers, and B is not a vector of integers, but A is still a vector of integers. Right? We have not changed A, right? And that's basically how you uh, how you make sure that you still comply with the old interface. You don't change it. If you don't change it, you still comply with whatever you complied with earlier. So that's great. However, persistent does it in O of one time and O of one space. Right, so a lot of people mishear me when I say it. I did not say it, as, it is as fast as lists. Python lists are faster, but it is all of one time and all of one space, right? So here, you know, I, I have just three elements, but imagine I had one million elements. B would not be a one million element copy, right? It would be um, all of one copy, and it would only uh, need the space to store the extra hello plus a constant overhead. Um, and, and you're like, oh, well, you know, O of one, but you know, O is kind of a lie, and you know, it's probably super slow. There's an optional C extension for vectors. And there's also maps, but uh, that's fine because maps are really just like a weird form of vectors, right? If you remember that from your CS classes, so it also supports the maps with the optional C extension. So it is actually pretty fast. It is not as fast as like, you know, Python's super hyper ip to myself, but it is fast enough for probably whatever you're gonna do. And it lets you make your array of thing be also an array of super thing, which is good. Um, and you're like, well, what if I have one of those deeply nested objects, right? So here, I, when I wrote it, I think I was working on a static blogging engine. So like the idea of data structures for blogs were like heavy on my mind. I think right now, every single one of the organizers for Peninsula has written their own blogging engine. Uh, so if you want to be an organizer for Nisla, just, just write a blog engine. Anyway, um, so this is like basically an abstract blog, right? It has a title, it has links, it has posts. As usual, the posts are very, very boring. And they say, ah, you know, I still don't have time to write a real post, but I'll, I'll, I'll write a post soon. Um, but then you're like, you know what? Like, still busy is kind of boring, maybe I'll just update it to pretty busy. You do not need to update every single point along the way, you just have transformers, so you say, well, find the thing that is addressed by posts, the second post, and the attribute content, and change that to pretty busy, and it will return to you a new blog, but none of the underlying objects will change. And, again, you only pay all one space for that, even if the blog has, like, you know, Millions of uh, entries. That's great, right? You have a nice API to do things pretty fast, and you never have to mutate everything, which means nothing can come over here and change what you have over there. What you have over there is still going to be over there, and it's going to be the same thing, literally, right? You can use it as a key to a dictionary. You can uh, print it out. It's going to be the same thing. Nobody can change it without you noticing that. Right? So that's, you know, if you actually convert it back to like, uh, something that Python can print out, you get uh, um, pretty busy instead of uh, uh, still busy. Um, so this is safe, right? Um, you probably are used to like people yelling at you when you have uh, an, uh, an an optional um, an optional uh, de a default argue a default value that's uh, mutable. That's because it's pretty bad. That's a good example of like one of those like hidden. 
uh, uh, global mutable states. Default values are globally, and like if you put them in, but now it's not mutable, right? But it is a vector, right? And I can extend it with two elements and then sum it. That's really, really useful, right? Like, you know, this is kind of a silly example, but this is a very, very common thing, right? You want to add something to like, you know, the list, and if I had to do it with a real list, I would have to start creating a new list. It would actually be slower, and it would be annoying to write. And if you try to put a tuple, then uh, Wukash will call the view and yell at you. Uh, he did it to me once. Uh, he, he was very nice about it, to be fair. I'm, I'm just saying this. But, uh, you know, it is right. Tuples are not the right data structure for that. Immutable vectors are. And luckily, you can have immutable version, but just using persistent. And they're even more uh, efficient than tuples. So immutability rocks. It makes your code much easier to reason about. When you have to reason about a function like this, you do not have to think, what if someone calls it again? The same thing. The same thing happens when someone calls it again. If that was a list, reasoning about that would be to a first approximation impossible. It's like, well, uh, depending on how many threads, I guess, and also like, I don't know, whatever. Probably a bug. Uh, so, and you know, like then someone yells at you in your code review and you change it to like equals none and you create a list and then you create lots of new lists and it also your code gets longer. And again, longer code, harder to reason about. You probably have some bug in the lines you introduced. Um, so it's, it's nice and you don't pay a lot, right? You do not pay any big O. You actually don't pay, you know, even in absolute terms, a big cost. So unless you're, you really want to be fast and you don't care about being correct, you probably want to start with immutable data structure. So hopefully now you're excited about immutable data structure as much as I am. Thank you very much. Almost no heckling. That was kind of disappointing, but thank you anyway. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Moshe. So let's see. Quick recap, just for me, we saw persistent, P Y R S. T I T N T. It's basically like a peninsula of of immutable libraries, right? Yep, yep. Okay. And if you look for this talk, by the way, it's under uh, github.com slash moses slash persistent. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Made a little joke there. <laughs> extra, extra overloaded. And the other one was adders, A T T R S. Yep. Okay. I do recommend checking those out. Hugh, you had a question? All right. You ready, Moshe? Yeah. I have a question about like the slide right next to the last, like the silly sum. Uh, sure. Is that v like the vector from persistent? Yep. Or yep. so that's not a tuples, right? That's not a tuple. Yeah. It's, okay, it's okay. a vector of two elements. Oh right? yeah, but uh, so you can so so a tuple like does not have a method called extend. Yeah, yeah. But and uh, this this code actually has a bug, right? They did not write extra equals extra dot extend, but this bug is easy to reason about. It will always do the wrong thing. This is great. A unit test it. it Comes up wrong, oh yeah, but, uh, right? but on the other hand, uh, this bug, if I had a list, would not be easy to test. The unit test would look like it's working. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I love, um, I love bug, buggy code on slides. What I'm asking is, like, is this vector part of the persistent? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so right. that's, that's basically persistent.v. Um, they made it especially short so that, like, you know, you, people's excuse will not be, ah, it's too long to type. I'll just type, like, you know, not too mm -hmm. long to type. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> that's one way to be. So, uh, oh, we got another question? Oh, here we go. Please. Hi, I have a question about the same function, actually. Sure. You said that you should be using this instead of using a tuple for this. Why not use a tuple? Aren't tuples uh, also immutable? Tuples are immutable. Tuples do not have a method called extend. Ah, that's the reason. And, okay. and like, you know, ima ima again, ima imagine that the default was like one million objects long, one million mm -hmm. things on, on, then you, sure, you could add one more thing to a tuple, you create a new tuple with ma one million and one elements, that's like really heavy for like, ah, you so know, just adding one thing. So the reason is to reduce the... Right, and yes, yeah, like, uh, because otherwise like people will code review, they'll be like, this is super expensive, just, you know, do the weird stuff that like, you know, is like broken, but like, you know, it's fast. Another question here? Yes. So, um, it's kind of like, um, does persistence sort of keeping the diff between the two objects, like the uh, original and the copy? It's, uh, because you, it's you not really a copy according to you, right? You should you should actually like read the implementation. It's pretty it's pretty neat. Uh, it's using like this bucket thing. Uh, it's not keeping the diff, right? So if you actually if you throw away the old stuff, it will garbage collect the old stuff. So if you keep extending and then throwing things away, that's fine. Like you know the the big O behavior will be correct. You will not be taking uh, infinite amounts of space. 
So are you, are you familiar with the uh, closures lists? Um, not really, but I think they use a very similar thing. Yeah, where basically like it keeps references to everything that you didn't change pretty much. Yeah. Um, yeah, but again, like I imagine that you have like you know like you 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 mutate the fifth element in a million element list like over and over again, then you do not keep up infinite space if you don't keep references to all the previous versions of the list, right? So that it, it does, like I said, like the big O behavior will be like the best thing that you can expect. So it's not doing like full versioning where I can somehow no, rewind it, it, time it's, it's or something? No, it's just like managing to kind of share the data cleverly. Okay, cool. Question here? Uh, typically one of the problems that people experience with immutability in data structures is garbage collection. And uh, so my question is, like, you know, since Python's garbage collector isn't a generational GC, you, um, why are you saying that? You uh, just said something incorrect. Uh, that it's uh, it's a it's a semi-generational GC. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. So my question is, like, how does garbage collection like impact uh, Python's? It's a, it's a semi-generational GC. Yeah. It it will probably do the right thing. You probably are not gonna you 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 probably are not gonna g run into performance issues from the garbage collector. If you are, you're doing something so specialized that you like whatever language you would use, you would have to start digging into the internals of the GC. It is it is a semi like it, it does try to keep the latest generation kind of recycled quickly to it. Like so, it it it, it is generation. There's no strict definition for generational GC, and like under some definition it is generational, under some definition it's not. And if you're worrying about the difference between those two, whatever language you would be using, you would start looking into the differences between their G versions of GC and start to tune your GC. You know, you would start be doing like you know the weird stuff that Instagram does with the GC to kind of like optimize stuff. Mm -hmm. um, at some point, when you optimize when, when you're optimizing enough, you're gonna care about like really really low level details of the GC. At that point, maybe immutable data structures won't be for you. Very few people are at that point. So what Instagram does is, uh, the weird thing they do is uh, turn, turn it off. off. <laughs> turn it off. They turn off the GC. Turn it off. Uh, so it's, it's, the oh. GC's back on. You didn't blog about that. Where's the announcement for the GC going back on? <laughs> 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 All right, you heard it here, folks. <laughs> Instagram flips the light switch off and on again. Um, <laughs> Doesn't mean you have to go home though, because we got are there more questions on this. Oh, there's another one, Khan, and oh, I'll go over here too. Thanks. Um, so on the big O question again. Sure. Uh, so say you have a very large uh, list of uh, vectors or something. Is sure. the random access time yeah, fast, yeah, or yeah, do so you have to traverse the so whole thing? So so access time is uh, all of one. All one. Oh, okay, yeah. that's pretty impressive then. Yeah. Very good, and uh, Rory, okay. You had uh, another simple example earlier, like halfway through the talk. Could you walk me through that? Because I is oh, A this and B this or one? something. Uh, nope, before that. Yeah, this what's one. going on here? Yeah. I, um, so A is a vector, right? So that's like a lot like writing a list of three elements, right? One, two, three. So imagine that A was just bracket one, two, three, right? Like it all almost behaves the same, except there's no mutation, right? So A is a persistent data structure, but B is saying the second element, right, as we remember, like, you know, uh, when we talked about uh, this is being the tenth peninsula, this is the second element, the second element is number one, um, set it to hello. So now B would be the vector one, hello, three. Right, this is exactly the same as, you know, if you A was a list and you would do A of one equals hello, if the not change, oh, it returns you a new vector. It would be, what would happen if I made the second element of A into hello? So now, B is not a vector of integers because it's one hello three, which is a vector of, I guess, ints and, and, and strings. Uh, but yeah, um, A is still good. Does that clarify what happens here? Um, I guess, wh wh why is it good to like, you know, add a string to a vector? Presumably someone really needed that, right? Like, um, if you look at like, you know, real Python code in the wild, you'll find that sometimes the lists are mixed. You'll find that the, the, you, you will find lists of like mixed integers and strings. Um, whether that's a smart idea or not depends, you know, like what someone is trying to accomplish, but presumably somehow they got there, and, and at that point that seemed like a good idea. So my point is, this does not preclude you from having a list of uh, like, like you know, the equivalent of a Python list with with numbers of integers, with number of strings. The important thing is that a that starts out as an, an array of integers is still an array of integers. That's not because it's an array of the same integers, namely one, two, three, because it can never change. I I may be able to contribute something here, Rory. So so right now a uh, a project I'm working on, uh, which I was going to 
maybe show off in the lightning talk. I don't know if it's ready yet, but uh, it's a security uh, thing. And basically, like you sort of load up a secure store, which we call a protected, right? And uh, we load it from a file. And we assume like it's valid. We validate it the first time. And then every modification that we perform on that object that represents the file must always result in another valid object, right? And so we want to guarantee is that like no version of this accessible to the library user or the command line application user is ever invalid in memory, right? At least from their code flow's perspective. So with this, uh, like with persistent and adders frozen equals true, uh, it, it makes you, it lets you ensure that basically every copy of a particular thing is valid for that time. You know, you're not just like changing things in place and if you had another thread going or something like that, it's broken halfway in between. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so, we can, so we can talk about it after and so here's, forth. Here's the way to think about it, right? Like, right? Imagine that um, I'm going to return uh, uh, B from this function, but before I return B, I make sure that all the elements are the same type. Now, the elements are not the same type, so I'm going to raise an exception. The important thing, I could do that, and I didn't change A, right? So anyone who had a reference to A, which was a valid object, still has a reference to A, which is still a valid object, right? So if I did um, return B, only after I validated B, no one from outside the function would ever see an invalid object. Right? And that's really important. Imagine that I, I got the string not from like, you know, someone writing it in the code, but from like, you know, some weird remote API that calls into me. Right? So this, this lets me make the object, check that object for validity, for example, and only return it if it's valid. And outside my function, nobody will see an invalid object, even though my function internally has invalid objects. And I can guarantee that. That's maybe like what you're trying to kind of go towards? Yeah. I, I will say that, um, I mean, yeah. Okay, we can talk about it a little bit more offline because I think there's an interesting analytics perspective you're interested in hearing about. Uh, but if okay. there's no more Th questions. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Moshe.